to share today on the painful riddle of life and the promised redemption. The painful riddle of life and the promised redemption, Ecclesiastes and beyond. Are you ready? So you're welcome to turn to your devices or your Bibles, paper Bibles, and uh, turn to that book hiding there in the Old Testament right after Psalms and Proverbs in case you needed a little help. Now on the phone, it's much easy because it's all there. You just had to click on that. And so, are you ready? Yes. Ecclesiastes and beyond. The painful riddle and the promised redemption. Anyone who has had the courage to venture through and read this book in the Old Testament will definitely find it very perplexing. It's a perplexing book. It's a difficult book to read. Those of you who tried doing that, and if you did not, I invite you for the experience of a lifetime. Go back home and take time and read it. A quick reading will take you half an hour, but a careful reading may take you more. Take time and read this book. It's in your Bibles. It's in the Bible of Jesus. And yet, as you read this book, it doesn't seem to make you feel like getting up and jump for joy. <laughs> in fact, it sounds very nihilistic. It doesn't seem to give you much hope. So, what do we do? Very many times, we do something with the Bible. When we really don't know what to do with the Bible, we decide to play, you know, what's called cherry picking. You know what's cherry picking? You go and pick up the parts that look nice. That's the kind of verses you get in the morning. You know, your friends send you WhatsApp, right? For those nice verses. Uh, I also get a few and I smile and I look at it. But uh, that's one way to deal with your Bible. The Bible is a wonderful book. And yet, it needs effort to really understand and grasp and apply scripture, especially many, many parts of scripture. So the easy way is just be happy with a few verses that are nice. That, you know, first thing in the morning, you get those verses, you make you feel good. But there are so many other verses that are not so pleasant. You don't want to see them in the early in the morning. Right? Isn't that true? So welcome to the wonderful world of the Bible, friends. And God's people are called, invited to work at reading and understanding. God does not give things chewed in his mouth to put into our mouth. He wants us to pick it up, bite, chew, struggle with the word of God. So you are looking at a book which is called a wisdom book. There are three books in the Old Testament. They are called wisdom books. A different genre of writing. It's not like Psalms. It's different. So you have the book of Proverbs where it seems to say, if you do these things, you'll be very successful. But then you have Ecclesiastes. This is like that wise critic who says, oh, really? You think so? You think life is like that? And he will give you a reality check and he says, check it out, that's not how life is. And then you have a wonderful, another book called the book of Job. A very different kind of writing. Struggling with suffering. And especially in the case of this man, Job, is a beautiful story that is trying to work with a certain simplistic view that many of God's people have. That is, we are good, and you worship the Lord, and you follow the Lord, and you give your tithes, and do everything nice. Only good will happen to you. Confess it. Get it. And Job will shock you. Such a long book saying, that's not always true. So you have these very beautiful three books. The wisdom books in the Old Testament. And so, from this book, if I asked you, 
if you have not recently read it, what are the verses that come to your mind from this book? I'll tell you. One of them is, uh, he has made everything. Beautiful. Yes, beautiful in his time. time. You know where that is? It's in chapter 3, verse 11. But it's not even the full verse. This is what we do. When we don't like even part of the verse, we don't look at that. We take what we like, right? The third part of that same verse will say, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So many times we don't even read the full verse because the rest of the verse may trouble us. So we just hold on. And I've given a name to this kind of disease that we all have that is called versitis. Versitis, sometimes even part of a verse. We just keep. Another one that you have surely heard. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. That is chapter 4, verse 12. It's a beautiful verse. It's a nice metaphor. In fact, last year for our daughter's wedding, we actually enacted that and they wanted that. And they called somebody and the three of them, they put this three strands together to say that God is with them. Basically, it says that life is bearable if you have a good companion or few companions. That's that whole section of chapter 4. However, friends, there are many, many, and I will, cannot take all my time to talk about verses that are not so pleasant. Let me read from 15. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these. The righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. So, here is advice for you. Do not be over-righteous. Neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked. Meaning you can be a little wicked. And do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and net, not let go of the other. Whoever fear God will avoid all extremes. Don't go into extremes, brother. Don't overdo your Bible and church and all that. That's in your Bible. Okay, the next one I want to read for you, especially for women. I want them to vote on this, women. Are you ready? So you have to give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Okay, are you ready? Women 7, 28. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Come on, women, vote. Let me see your vote. How do you like this verse? You like to get that in the morning? What about chapter 10, verse 19? A feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry. You want to put that somewhere? That's in your Bible. And next section of that verse. And money is the answer for everything. You want to say amen to that? <laughs> money is the answer for everything. It's in your Bible. How do we read the Bible? Obviously, this is not the best way to use the Bible. You can find enough verses to trouble you. And yet, this book is one of the most relevant books in the Bible. An Old Testament scholar, wonderful person I learn a lot from, John Walton. Some of you, if you're writing things, write these names down. I think in the notes I've mentioned a few people who are wonderful uh, scholars of the Old Testament. You can listen to them on YouTube, learn from them. I mentioned three names there. Let me help you to get a maybe like a Google survey of this book so that you can begin to read it when you go back home. Actually, this book has two authors, not one. It's not difficult if you read carefully, you'll find that. Let me show you. There are two unnamed voices and two messages. All right? So the first person, you see chapter 1, verse 1, it says, the words of the teacher. Many translations have different words for this, but the Hebrew word is the word koheleth. 
And the best of Old Testament scholars say we are not very sure what that means. Is this the name of a person? It can mean a gatherer. So some Bible translations use words like preacher. Others like NIV uses the word teacher. The message translation uses the word quester. Quest, you're on a quest. Or one even uses the word philosopher. So it's difficult to figure out who this person is, but it says, the words of the Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, please understand the word son of David is a generic word. It does not mean necessarily his biological sons. It just means sometimes a Jew. Jesus was called son of David, you know that. And he was the son of David, in a sense, for those who believe in the Messiah. So... Here is a book. We really don't know who the author, who this Kohelet is. It's not necessarily Solomon, please. And by the way, Solomon, as you read the whole story, is not a very wise man, isn't it? Right? Imagine trying to collect thousand women around you. You know, some of us who are married long enough, one is enough. <laughs> yeah. Grateful. Uh, so this is not necessarily Solomon, okay? Some of them may seem like, oh, it sounds like Solomon, but there are other passages which seem like, sounds like just an ordinary commoner. So we really don't know who the author of this. But not just that, Kohelet is the guy who gets to speak most of the time. He has probably gathered all kinds of writings and wisdom, gathered it, put it together. But there is another person called the author. The author shows his hand by saying, introducing Kohelet. So look at verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Your Bibles are open. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. So that's your author. Okay? And then your author will come again at the end of the book, chapter 12 and uh, verse 9. Not only was a teacher wise, so this author is introducing the, or Kohelet. So the rest of the book is in the words of this unknown person, Kohelet. And it does in the scriptures, the value and the inspiration or the life-giving nature of scriptures do not depend on who the author is, okay? Because many, many writings of the Old Testament and New, we may not know who the author or authors were. But scripture is life-giving because God's people consider that. And they believe that the Holy Spirit has enabled the authors to put something that ultimately will bring life to the people of God and wisdom. That's what Paul will say in 2 Timothy 3.15 about wisdom. So this is a wisdom book. What do we do with it? So the summary of what the Kohelet or the teacher says is found in verse 2. Look at that. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. You like that? You want to put that up somewhere? On your study or somewhere? Just in the Bible? Chapter 12, verse 8, again. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. So basically you have like, if you want to put it, the brackets as we call it. That's the Main point the Kohelet is going to come up with. Of course, he will say many more things. It is under the sun, as you read that. Remember that phrase comes, under the sun. I mean, that's where most of the time we are living. We are not going too much into space or under the sea, right? Most of the time we are under the sun. And uh, vanity, that's the King James, right? So if you are a King James lover, you'll find the word vanity. Only thing, the vanity today is used more in cosmetics. So I don't know what that means today to most of us. It is like chasing after the wind. Have you ever tried doing that? None of us is foolish enough to do that, right? And this is what he says. And yet the author wants you to hear that, but he will give you the last word. You know, many times in conversations, we have these conversations and arguments. And my family reminds me very often, please give others a chance to speak. Yes. So I must keep myself when I'm given a chance to speak, to speak. But, you know, we all like to have the last word. Right? 
the other day somebody put out a, a poster there was a little boy walking uh, wearing a t-shirt and he says uh, dad rocks but at the back was but mom rules <laughs> <laughs> so who gets the last word the author gets the last word in this book and we will listen to what he has to say friends and then after this book we are not just jews who are reading this we are followers of jesus and we cannot just read this book and be stuck with this we have to come where the story and the reason we are here is because of the lord jesus so we will look at that christian we have to go beyond ecclesiastes otherwise it is truly not a satisfying answer but you and i friends are not the only ones who think about life who struggle with questions believers are not those who have no questions believers have the most difficult questions to ask see if you're not a believer you don't believe in god and all you just say okay this happened you know bad luck right but believers have questions that's why you have the whole book of job because believers have questions and sometimes we give answers not always good answers as you can see from the book of job very sincere answers those three friends of job and one more guy all the answers they gave were miserable answers in fact god said ultimately what he said is not right so what do we do life is a riddle one of our indian poets yogesh gaur he penned this words almost 50 plus years ago very well known growing up in the central part of india you know you have to hear songs all the time whether you are awake or sleeping they are blasting these songs old songs and i only remember these old songs 50 plus year old and the words of this song that yogesh gaur penned zindagi kaisi hai paheli hai kabhi to hasaye kabhi wo rulaye some of you are educated sorry i'm just joking this song became a very popular song in an old movie i mean i did not know what the where this song came from till recently and i googled and i found out oh it is from a very very interesting movie called anand the 1971 and two famous film stars they were not that famous that time rajesh khanna was already a star and he's anand then and um, amitabh bachchan is one dr bhaskar he's an oncologist you know dealing with cancer he's a very serious kind of guy but very sensitive guy this amitabh bachchan who's not yet a, a a a great star at that time and he's very taken up he's very sad about suffering he says is there a cure for suffering is there a cure for poverty i mean he's that kind of person he is very sensitive he's not very good with relationships so he struggles how to tell his girlfriend that he wants to marry her all that but anand suddenly finds that he has cancer terminal cancer and he decides to live life joyfully the last part of his life and he decides to live it happily and to spread love and even to help this doctor bhaskar to find a way to tell the girl how much he loved her it's a very interesting story but the song is wise life is a riddle and just because we are followers of jesus are we going to have all only laughter and joy all our time the fact is we did not have that and we will not have it in the future so this book is here to remind us that life is a roller coaster do not get things mixed up in life normal is not ideal ideal is not normal and because we follow jesus we are not going to be escaping the challenges the pains the the suffering in this world even so kohelet will teach us what does he say three things one by one quickly he wants us 
to have a reality check unexpected sickness cancer failures unbelievable accidents that you can't even believe how could that happen adjust your expectations that's wisdom and so he's going to say three things this is just my summary very quick summary with the help of so many of people i learn from three things that he says number one time time he says is a blink let me read chapter 1 verse 4 for you generations come and generations go but the earth remains forever we are sitting here today 40 years from now many of us won't be here we don't even know where this church will be in 40 years just life is a blink look at chapter 1 uh, verses 10 to 11 is there anything of which one can say look this is something new it was here already long ago it was here before our time no one remembers of former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them hmm time is a blink if you have been following the james webb telescope that is out in space and sending these amazing pictures of the universe and you're seeing images that are actually from billions of years ago i mean it's just mind blowing and you and i are just a speck in this huge universe which we still don't know how big it is and yet here we are because we believe that god has created us and we are valuable made in his image as his representatives wow but yet time is a blink the march of time is relentless and we will all be taken up in that we can't escape secondly he will say death is a great equalizer <laughs> the rich the very rich will die and some of them will be lucky enough to get a burial some of you who've been following what happened in the last few days with that submersible that went down to see the ruins of the titanic and those five extremely rich men lost their lives and they will never get a burial so even getting a burial is a blessing on friday happened to be my birthday people were wishing me i hope you have a wonderful day and i was here in the morning in the baptist mortuary doing a funeral service of an older man he had lived a long life but that was the morning and then we went to the cemetery and i did a burial and i thought that was a great privilege to be able to do that and one of my friends who i've come to know during these the covid days during the online bible studies and i met him there and i was so glad to see him and then as we were leaving i saw him coming back and he said bye bye and he just happened to say and i heard it thankfully because sometimes i don't hear okay yeah. and i don't respond appropriately i heard him he say our son is buried here and he's younger than me and i stopped i heard it and i said what did you say he said our son is buried here i said can we see the grave it was just close by he showed me his son's grave joel joshua 2 years old he was a healthy child something suddenly happened rushed to the hospital and he died he said he would have been 21 today he has another son who's 18 death can come anyway great equalizer chapter 9 verse 2 and 3 chapter 9 2 and 3 all share a common destiny the righteous and the wicked the good and the bad the clean and the unclean those who offer sacrifices and those who do not as it is with the good 
so with the sinful as it is with those who take oaths so with those who are afraid to take them in other words everyone dies the good the bad and the ugly chapter 12 1 to 7 and i'm not going to read that section it's a section that talks about old age but you read about that read that passage old age is not easy for those of you who are old i understand and for those who are taking care of old people you know your hands are trembling your teeth are gone remember in those days you didn't have these dentists who could give you a full set of teeth <laughs> and many other things we don't have time to study that right now but that's and then you die that's what he's saying so the first thing is time second death death all of us none of us will escape it thirdly random life is unpredictable you know you'll walk out of this church service and you'll get a message and you say what how did that happen now sometimes random things could be nice things can happen but many times not so nice things happen life is unpredictable chapter 9 verse 11 911 i have seen something else under the sun the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned but time and chance happen to them all anything can happen at any time to anybody so what do we do and then he has this one phrase or one word that he uses again and again and again more than 3 dozen times he uses a word that is translated differently in many of our translations and one of them is meaningless meaningless everything is meaningless more than 3 dozen times what does this mean let me just explain to you the word he uses of course he's writing in hebrew is the word hevel hevel you see those uh, the hebrew letters uh you actually know this word but you don't recognize it this is the name of a character in the primeval story of adam and eve what are the names of their sons cain and hebel it's hebel his name was hebel we are used to abel but it is hebel and this word you struggle to translate that so the message translation i think has got it better even it says smoke everything is just smoke what does that mean smoke you know it's like a vapor don't we have that verse in the book of james where it says don't you know your life is like a mist you can't hold smoke in your hand you try to hold it you can't it's mystifying it's confusing it's unclear we don't know what to do with this in other words the algebra of life is not so simple you can learn algebra in school but the algebra of life is little more tricky difficult to understand it's not like you are a good person only good will happen to you and you say oh he was a very good man see he is having a good funeral not necessarily the algebra of life is hebel it's tough to understand that's what he is saying it's unclear and so the the teacher or the kohelet is going to tell you you know what go ahead enjoy you want to make money go ahead make money pursue it but just remember ultimate fulfillment is not on the table you're not going to get that but go ahead enjoy enjoy whatever you can your work enjoy your work fame you want to get it go go ahead enjoy it but ultimate fulfillment is not on the table you want to go after pleasure go ahead enjoy it but just remember at the end it is hebel 
So you have a book that is idol busting. It busts all the idols that you and I are pulled towards, the idols of this world. I know many of us may not think of idols. We don't keep any religious images or things carved with or made. With. No, but the idols we is what drives our life. That's, those are the idols we have. Of money, pleasure, fame, whatever. The teacher says, just to let you know at the end, self-fulfillment is not what you'll get. It's going to, but enjoy. Then he says, accept heaven. What is he saying? Accept it. This is how life is. But that doesn't mean nothing is useful. It doesn't mean you don't live life. You know, I better die. No, 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 no. He says, but enjoy whatever you can. Look at chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Chapter 5, 18 and 19. This is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, to enjoy life and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. So, Think of life, whatever you get. Think of it as a gift. Enjoy it. However, don't expect lasting fulfillment with any of these. Enjoy it. When you enjoy that biryani, enjoy it. Deal with your cholesterol later. You know? Now I'm getting a little more strictures because my sugar level has gone up. So once in a while only I bite into an ice cream. Enjoy it. He will say, enjoy life with your wife. Enjoy whatever you have. But just remember, there is no ultimate lasting fulfillment. When this is over, quickly, I need to go quickly. The time is running. The author gets the last word. What does the author say at the end of the book? Come quickly to the end of the book. Verse 9. Not only was a teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. That's why some people think the word kohelet means a gatherer who collects things and put these proverbs together. The teacher searched to find just the right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. Whatever you have heard till now is good. Okay. The words of the wise are like goads. You know what is a goad? Goad is something like a pointed stick. You know, some sheep don't listen to just come. You know, they need a little poke. And uh, he says, their collected sayings are like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Some of us need that goads once in a while. Be warned, my son. Now comes the author of anything in addition to them, of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. For those, in case you are my student sitting here, this is not an excuse for not reading, okay? It says many books. You can read few at least. Don't find excuse for not looking at books. What he's saying is ultimately even wisdom has its limitations. And then he summarizes. Now all that has been heard, here is the conclusion. He gives his conclusion. Fear God, three things. Fear God and then keep his commands and this is the duty of all mankind for God will bring every deed into judgment including every hidden thing whether it is good or evil. The slide please. Here you are. Three things. Fear God, keep his commands, and be conscious of the judgment end. Actually, it is a summary of the whole Old Testament. The Torah, that's keeping the commandments. The fear God, which is Ketubim, it's part of the wisdom literature. And then you have from the prophets, the idea of judgment. And so the whole scripture is summarized, follows scripture. Fear God is not about, you know, having, a, like we use the word fear. I know I'm no longer a 
slave to fear as we sang it is about a right relationship a dependence on a good god as we sang a god is good depend on him and then keep the commandments and be conscious live in the light of the coming judgment now basically he's saying put god first put god first sometimes you could read a book like this and go into a space where sometimes in the past christians have gone into sometimes christians have said you know we are not called to enjoy anything in this world they want to look down at everything in this world there's a latin phrase contemptus mundi that means a contempt of the world but that's not what this book is telling us it's saying there are good beautiful things in this world enjoy them enjoy them if you like the dress you chose to wear today you know enjoy it the food you're going to eat your life you have chosen to do the car you have decided to buy whatever enjoy it we are not called to hate things in this world but yet life will remain a painful riddle where is the promised redemption that's where we come beyond ecclesiastes to our faith in the lord jesus christ you know friends our faith must adequately grapple with all these realities quickly let me show you a few verses of how um we can look at by the way the book of ecclesiastes is not mentioned anywhere in the new testament by anyone directly but you have a very interesting passage in romans 8 verse 20 and let me explain how this could be seen as a connection with the book of ecclesiastes what is a phrase that is found everywhere in this book ecclesiastes which is a phrase meaningless meaningless that's hebel right now many of god's people jewish people would read their bible not in hebrew they would read their bibles in greek when those who lived outside of palestine and so there was this what is called a septuagint lxx that was a greek translation of the old testament interestingly the word in greek for hebel is the word matthaios the slide please and there this word matthaios is the word that you find in romans chapter 8 and verse 20 so let me read from verse 18 romans 8 verse 18 i consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of god to be revealed verse 20 for the creation was subjected to matthaios that's the greek word used for hebel in the book of ecclesiastes creation there is matthaios there is this so called mystifying confusing aspect of life not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of god we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth there are three groanings mentioned in chapter 8 one is creation is groaning we are part of that creation and not only so but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies we are groaning creation is groaning we are groaning and later on paul will say in verse 26 in the same way the spirit helps us in our weakness we do not know what we ought to pray for but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans three groanings we groan creation groans and the holy spirit groans through us as we pray and god is bringing a wonderful redemption friends you know why it's promised and it we know this is a promise god will keep because of the resurrection of jesus hallelujah 
That is our future. Many times when we think we die and we say our spirit goes and lives in heaven in a retired life. That is not our future. Our future is a resurrected body and a new heaven and new earth. That is what Romans 8 is talking about. And nothing will separate us from this great plan of God because it's already begun in the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus, our Redeemer, comes. He comes into this world. Let me quickly read Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus enters into our world, becomes part of this world, and the moment he becomes part of this world, he enters into the world of Hebel. He experiences it on our behalf. He in fact experiences physical death along with us. But then as we sang, he was in the grave and he comes out and he's resurrected and we are in him. That is the hope that we have. The redemption of life. Jesus took the curse that is on us or the hebel, or this reality, mystifying reality. He entered into it. He fully embraced it. So that he can embrace us all. Hallelujah. And in him we have this wonderful redemption. Friends, today we have the redemption of life. We have a hope. And our hope is not that every time we will get healed when we pray. Because we also conduct funeral services. But our hope is ultimately we will not lose. Because remember what did Kohelet say? Death is sure to come. Yes. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Come on. And the life. He who believes, those who believe in me shall never die. Jesus says, I have the keys of death and Hades. He has the keys. Hallelujah. That's the promised redemption that we have. That's our hope, friends. And so we can live freely. Not afraid of death. Because we know the one who can open that gate of death. Hallelujah. And give us this wonderful body, a resurrected body like his. We can live in faith, freedom for a fruitful life. We can live a life of love, sacrificial love. Crazy love like the love God has for us and live a life of love. I know Romans 8 is a very beautiful passage and many people love it and we like to read all of it. But I just want to mention Romans chapter 8. We read that we are more than conquerors and we all that. And you have a verse in verse 36. Look in your Bibles, Romans 8, 36. There's a quotation. For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to the slaughter. By the way, that is a quotation from Psalm 44. Turn to Psalm 44 later on and read it. The first eight verses are wonderful. Everything is nice. But after that, verse 9 starts off saying, But God, you have given us up. Read the next part. It's about suffering. It's as if God has abandoned us. The psalmist is saying that. Do you pray like that? God, you have given up on me? The psalmist does. And this verse, verse 22 of, of Psalm 44, is part of that experience of the psalmist of being abandoned by God, apparently. And yet he's speaking to God. He knows God is not abandoned. But that's how he feels. The wonderful hope we have, friends, is that Jesus has redeemed us from this hebel of this world. We are not going to escape it. But we are going to be victorious. Hallelujah. We will live lives of hope. We will live lives of faith. And we will live lives of love. Why? 
because Jesus is the victor.